Um, Mark, is there more to do to record it than just click the start record button? Okay, well I just did that. So.
a roundtable working meeting relating to the zoning petition filed by MIT uh, called MIT QD5. No public comment uh, will be uh, taken and no votes will be taken. And the meeting will not be televised by uh, CCTV. So uh, at this time, uh, Henry Davis, I'm the mayor, and I have convened this meeting, uh, duly convened the meeting, I believe. And uh, as it's a working session of the uh, around an ordinance matter, um, it's my intention at this time to turn the meeting over to the chair of the ordinance committee, uh, David Marr, to help us run the discussion. Mayor, yeah, would you announce that it is being recorded? Uh, Not by you, but it is. That it is. Because it is. Um, uh, certainly. Uh, uh, not officially being reported, but you know the press is allowed with permission to, uh, of course, to, to um, and, and without uh, interrupting our process. Not again. Um, to uh, to record, and, uh, and that's what is happening here uh, for those of you who may see the recorded version of this. So, uh, Council Lamar, I, I think that we're um, we're informal here, and you know, up to you how you want to manage that. But the idea here is that we'll have a chance to. Um, uh, respond to uh, a lot of what we've heard from the public at multiple meetings, and um, we, uh, we're hearing in emails, and we're hearing, we've heard at our, our regular meetings, and we've heard at ordinance committee meetings, and uh, we haven't had an opportunity to process that. And under our rules, a uh, group of five can't do that without doing that um, in, in a meeting that's called as an official meeting, and that's this round table. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I, I want to um, just take a quick minute to welcome Hugh Russell, who is the chair of the uh, planning board, who is here with us this morning, and I thought it was important for the council to have the opportunity to um, talk with Hugh and get um, the perspective of, of the planning board, uh, as I know that you folks spent a great deal of time. Uh, in addition, the uh, manager, I had asked uh, the, the city manager to um, have uh, ready for today uh, really the um, a summary of the tax implications of the proposed uh, project. Um, we also have with us um, Aram and Stuart and Roger from CBD, as well as Jeff um, and Chris Clotter from Housing, uh, who will be able to answer questions and, and help us uh, with the dialogue that we have today. Um, I do want to just mention that uh, David Manfredi, who is uh, the architect who has been working on this project is with us um, for a limited time. So if there are questions specific to uh, David, um, I would ask that people ask those questions uh, early uh, as he has a prior commitment. And with that, I am going to, to ask uh, Steve Marsh to give us a quick uh, overview and update, and then we will um, be taking, as the mayor said, informally questions back. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, Mr. Chairman. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to join you today. Uh, we're looking forward to a helpful and productive discussion here. I did want to mention a uh, housekeeping matter. We are having uh, our open house uh, tomorrow from uh, 10 to 12 and next Tuesday from 6 to 8 at this space at Mount Broadway next to Five Grand Saints where we uh, do have a, a couple other uh, uh, models and some uh, visuals that might help people better understand some of the final details of our petition and we we're working on those. We're still continuing to work on them, uh, but they might be helpful, we thought, to uh, the members here and the public. Uh, I'd like to quickly just introduce uh, the folks that are with me tonight, uh, I mean today, uh, Israel Ruiz, our Executive Vice President and Treasurer, uh, Professor Marty Schmidt, our Associate Provost, Michael Wu was with me as well, and Sarah Gallup and David and Freddie uh, are also here today. Uh, as you mentioned, David has to leave in about an hour. Uh, just some basic comments. I think today helps us frame some of the information we've received over the last several months since we filed our second petition. The new petition, which was shaped by the planning board, was significantly changed uh, by the work that we did with both the community and the planning board through, I think, you know, we, I think we had 10 meetings at the planning board when I, when I was looking back on it. Uh, I'm happy to see you here today, but I think it helps in the conversations. Um, you know, most importantly, I think the basis of our decision not to move forward with the original petition was to respond to city council issues, um, mainly around the, the desire for broad mix of uses in our petition, and frankly, to think deeper about how the petition intersects with the community. And I think we spent uh, an enormous amount of time in the 18 to 20 months that follow in the community with the planning board um, and hearing members of council's concerns, 
um, it would come forward uh, with the help of the planning board in the community with what we believe is a much better petition today. Over the course of the three public ordinance committee meetings, we also learned that the council that we need to focus and refine other aspects of our petition, and we're working to do that as we speak. Some of the areas we heard from the council, I would have mentioned grad housing. One, the council reiterated what we've already heard from our task force, uh, which was undertaken by uh, the provost uh, at the request of the president, that we needed to take a deeper look at graduate housing from you know, multiple perspectives, and that is underway at this point in time. Since this study was announced, the council and the members of the MIT community have uh, helped us move that study forward uh, and refine our thinking about both the timetable for that study and its direction. Uh, both Israel and Marty uh, can speak uh, more to that after uh, uh, Hugh's uh, comments. Uh, just another component that uh, we thought was important to address is retail. We think we've developed a very exciting vision for Kendall Square, and I think uh, we're, we're delighted to share that with folks and, and excited about what we'll do in the area. Um, but we have another question, well, how do we make sure this really happens as we say it will? Um, you know, our large-scale model uh, that's down on Broadway will hope highlight some of the retail and open space opportunities. We developed this to help us understand what would happen at the street level and to think about the retail mix uh, at a more granular level. So again, that is a model that we're continuing to refine, but we're happy to share that work in progress and it helps people understand it better. We recently heard from council that we needed to focus more on sort of the teeth of our retail and open space activation. The base zoning that we have here has both requirements for open space and activation criteria, and the zoning sets new precedents on a number of these items including incentives for smaller and increased uh, retail uh, uses, um, activated street frontage, but we've heard from the council that this may need to go even further. Uh, just some of the comments that we've heard uh, recently. One councilor you know, noted the need for the gro a grocery store near the community and uh, wanted to ensure that the type of retail is diverse and locally based. We've heard that time and time again. Uh, another council spoke passionately about programming the active spaces in the district with community-friendly activities, and I, I, we get that. We've been focusing on that, we're taking that very seriously, and we're working to address those deeper issues uh, in the coming weeks here. Uh, making sure that there was child-friendly activities, even for Saturday's open house, was, was a request. So we're making sure that we're doing that for Saturday. But I think this is an example uh, of what the council community sees and has asked us in terms of an attitude overall with Kendall Square, a lot of inclusiveness, making sure that we're making this an inviting place for all of us. So we realize that this can only be successful if we continue to talk and to listen uh, to the council and the surrounding community about how this thing evolves and Kendall Square and make sure it works for all of us. Uh, another item that we talked about was uh, referring is the mix of units. Um, generally, East Cambridge and Cambridge as a whole, uh, there are thousands of units coming online and going around. I have spoken uh, to that issue before. We continue to hear excitement about One Broadway, our housing there, which we're referring to as Innovation Landing. Um, but we've heard from the council that we need to be clear about the type of uh, housing community that it will be, uh, and you know, as it sets precedence for others going forward in the, in the Kendall area. We've heard that, and we want to be clear that the housing community will offer low, moderate, and market units. It will range from bedroom sizes from uh, micro units and innovation units to three family units. Uh, the high end count and the configuration that we have here will allow us to do multiple things at the site. I think we can uh, really look at it as something that we can offer something for everyone in this district and we believe that you know, we will all be proud of that uh, uh, on execution. It will be a precedent and we will learn from this experience as we uh, pioneer some of these new uh, mixes. Marty and Israel will uh, speak a little bit about housing issues at, at MIT and uh, we'll add some more detail to that uh, conversation as well. And we know that Cambridge, what Cambridge does affects MIT and what MIT does affects Cambridge. And I think that synergy is really important. And I think it's a key theme that we've, uh, we've learned and thought about throughout this entire planning process in Kendall, particularly where we see this as really a mixing bowl for the community. Workforce issues was another area. We've heard a lot about from the council um, and workforce issues. Uh, the, the mayor uh, asked for a jobs report today and we will uh, provide some information on that. And we all recognize that Kendall Square as an economic engine is amazing, but we've also come to realize that all of us uh, have to do a better job of connecting that engine to the broader community. I've heard that theme time and time again. Uh, because of that challenge, uh, at the council's direction, we began talking with the building trades uh, about how construction jobs can relate to jobs uh, for Cambridge community residents. 
And this is just one example of what we and you can do together to create a pipeline to help residents connect directly to the Kendall Square experience. The city of Cambridge works very hard in this regard, but I believe that all will welcome more direct relationships uh, to the residents. I think, as you heard um, last week, Marty Walsh, the president of the Metro Boston Trades Council, committed to a Pathways to Apprenticeship program uh, here in Cambridge. Uh, and MIT will help create and maintain that program. Uh, Boston residents have benefited from such a program uh, for years, uh, and it's time that, that the construction that occurs here relates directly to the opportunity for Cambridge residents. So we'll continue to work on that. We have more, we'll have more details on that with Marty shortly. Uh, just on the community fund, um, generally we've heard good things about the community fund. It's uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, it focuses on the areas we've heard the most about through this community-based process, and that is open space, workforce development, and transit. The framework came from the K2 uh, community process, uh, but things like membership of the fund committee and credit for improvements that MIT may do on work on other properties have been brought up and we're thinking about them and any concerns that people have. So we know this piece will evolve and we're open to the changes that we suggested there. Uh, yeah, in closing, we've heard a lot about a number of other issues and we're working very hard and I'm sure we'll hear more today as we continue the dialogue. Some of them are complex, others are more basic, but we think the process will result in a far better product. In fact, I think it already has. Um, so I want to uh, say that we have a number of folks here today and we're looking forward to these uh, you know, diverse perspectives and both this and all So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm just wondering if you're planning to structure the conversation around uh, sort of topics or just how, how you might like to see doing that. I know that um, I'm certainly interested in uh, the community benefits aspect, but um, you've indicated that maybe we should defer talking about that until after we talk about design issues. but. Are there some big topics we could kind of work topically around rather than um, you know, everybody throwing out their ideas as we customarily do? Yeah, I, 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 I wanted to get to Q, and then I wanted to uh, have a run, um, just touch on a couple of things that were just said by Steve, and then kind of move to questions, if that makes sense. But, um, and I don't mean to, to put you right on the spot right away, Q, but, if you if you could just help the council understand the perspective of the planning board and the process of the planning board, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just kind of throwing this out there and saying that that some people have suggested that the process has been rushed. And can you kind of address that aspect of the, the perception? I'll do my best. Uh, I guess I will. Uh, I could start in 1924 <laughs> <laughs> when the uh, body imposed the zoning uh, uh, rules and regulations in the city. Uh, and uh, the Kendall Square zoning didn't change very much uh, in that city uh, uh, until relatively recently. Um, the industry B zone that covered much of what's in the 85 district was intact, um, I think, in uh, the year 2000. Um, of course, the area changed enormously from being a very vital and active uh, industrial district to uh, now a district that's, that you all know, all to characterize it. You, could you speak really into the microphone for me? I know you're yeah. probably the one who has the hardest time hearing, but uh, right, I'm the hardest thank time speaking. you. <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. Uh, so, thank you. The, uh, the council and the city engaged in a rezoning effort about a dozen years ago called Citywide Rezoning. And at that time, uh, we looked, there was an East Cambridge planning study. Uh, which covered this area, and the, uh, we determined that the best thing to do, we were worried about the impacts of new development, so we actually reduced the permitted development density um, in Kendall Square by almost exactly the amount that is on the table today to increase it. Um, and so, what we've learned in the last 12 years is that we've been very successful 
in doing many things. We end this work. We're attracting, you know, the world's best uh, biotech industry. We have arguably the world's best technological institution that's been there for nearly 100 years. Um, we have another fabulous institution in Harvard Square. Uh, that energy has produced an enormous amount of <coughs> activity, growth, and uh, contributions to mankind. Um, as um, Councillor Reeves started pointing out to us quite many years ago, the physical reality of Kendall Square has not kept up with the intellectual um, activity. So what's happening now, from, from the point of view, from my point of view, and I think it's the point of view, is that we have the opportunity to see what we can, how we can improve what's there, how we can, and I don't tweak is perhaps a little small word, but how do we adjust what we're doing to encourage the best possible things to happen? And um, I'm not going to again give you that list because I think you need to know what that list is. Um, Steve covered many of those points in his opening remarks. Um, the planning board views this as a extremely important matter. We think the general rezoning of the city are the most important work we do. Uh, this is a very important area. Um, and uh, the Kendall Square, Central Square study that you initiated several years ago uh, was an enormous contribution because it, it meant that the city you know, went out and engaged in the formal process with a lot of outside help to really dig in and get to the bottom of things. Um, but that was a couple of years ago. That's when we started. In my pile of, of paper here, this, is, this stack is just the MIT stack. <coughs> the rest of the notebook is the rest of the area. Um, my, first, my first piece of paper here is dated 2010. It's now 2013. We've been moving along. I don't think we're moving really precipitously by any means. We're moving deliberately, um, carefully, con consulting people, everybody who's interested in the same. Um, so I think it's time to act on what we can do now and move forward to complete this study, complete this study recommendations. So that's, that's where we're at. I, I hope you will, you will act on this favorably, because we've studied it for a long time. We're very happy with the MIT piece of it. And we're very happy with the design guidelines. That is a parallel activity that goes along and will affect the entire district. And we're also anxious to move on to, to both Central Square and to the other parts of this district that have not yet been to reduce design language. Thank you. Um, and Ron, if, if you might also just on, on the subject that Steve mentioned, the kind of the pipeline of, of housing that is being currently built in the city, if you can um, shed some light on the numbers and, and the types of housing that are coming on board. Sure. I'm actually going to ask Stuart to respond to that one. Well. Um, 
not only available very close to this area, which you know we also we realize the value of uh, creating a sense of place, creating um, matches with workers who want to be right down the street, but also the overall um, housing that's in the city. And we took a look back and. Um, at the last about 12 years since uh, 2006 the rezoning that um, Hugh talked about. And if, if many people here remember the citywide rezoning, at that time when we reduced the commercial, allowed commercial development in the city, almost one third across the, the whole city, we left the um, uh, density of housing alone at that time, giving the preference to housing development across the city. And that, at that time, we were looking very carefully at the jobs housing balance in the city and thinking about what was the appropriate level for Cambridge to be at to do its fair share uh, regionally for housing, uh, considering the amount of jobs that they've had. And over this period of the last a dozen years, we've improved that balance, and people may not guess that, but uh, we've actually um, uh, produced um, a, a, a number of over 4,000 units, I think it is. And this map shows um, in, I don't know if you can see, but in a series of dots, the blue dots are housing projects that have been completed since 2001, and the small ones are smaller numbers, and the large ones are over 300 and above. The orange ones are ones that are in construction right now, so you'll see actually the face of side up is an orange one up uh, in route two, and uh, the uh, twine. Uh, Twenty properties, one in Kendall Square shows up as orange, and uh, permanent or, or permitting. And the, for years, we've shown a north point with some pretty large red dots there, and they remain there as large red dots, as in permitting, having been permitted a number of years ago after the Eastern Cambridge study. But in fact, there is, they are in, uh, starting construction now on a very large project. Um, they're called Building M. Ron, um, would you mind moving it around so that the public can see? Um, the ones watching from home. Okay. One, as soon as Stuart stops pointing to it, I'll turn it around. The, the great the great dots are also our commercial development. So in this map, we try to sort of just focus on the housing and the um, and permitting the number of uh, more than about a thousand units out in the Elmwood area, and that's uh, due uh, not um, uh, it's a small addition to the current Elmwood rezoning that the council did in um, 2006, I think it was. Uh, so as we looked at the number of housing units during the Kendall Square study, we thought about not only how many jobs, uh, uh, how many uh, housing units were going to be uh, within walking distance, and within walking distance, we looked at not only the very tight little sort of quarter mile circle, but a reasonable sort of 15 minute walk, and that gets you to up closer to North Point, gets you up towards uh, Central Square, gets you to the um, Osborne Triangle and uh, not only in Kendall Square. And look at that as sort of the, the larger reasonable universe for housing for Kendall Square. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, do you have a question? Thanks. I guess um, you mentioned that, I guess, the architect was the one that had to leave early. Uh, so I can questions for both, but I... David's trying to hang out the corner. Come on up. Uh, before I get to that, uh, I think so just, before I get to the stuff, trying to see it still see improved uh, in this petition. I wanted to just acknowledge uh, and how far, this, how much this petition has changed over uh, just the past couple of months. Um, been really pleased, uh, I guess, in terms of the, uh, the retail. Um, very pleased that uh, we, know, we, know we had an issue earlier on uh, with Red Cross and the setback uh, and how uh, the potential development your one Broadway might impact their building. Um, very pleased that the vast been changed. Uh, very pleased with uh, capital and overall parking. Uh, the innovation space has changed from the, from the previous petition, although we're still uh, asking for more on that. Uh, I think that the, there's a lot that the, uh, the petition has I think, um, come forward on. Uh, most notably, I think I've been pressing uh, all of you on this issue of housing, uh, both graduate student housing and postdoc housing. And I uh, was very pleased to hear that uh, Professor Clay was named to head up the, uh, the committee, the task force, on doing a very comprehensive study on, on housing. I've, I've gone and spoken with him, uh, and he kind of outlined his methodology and explained a bit of it to uh, people in the room. They're bringing on to the task force 
uh, people from, from all the different walks of life that are part of the MIT community. Also, the grad students, the grad students with children, the grad students with spouse but not children, uh, postdocs, uh, and then really looking at uh, not only what they say they want, but what they've done in terms of their housing decisions uh, since coming to the Institute. Uh, I think the, I can't articulate, fully articulate the entire methodology. I think he's, he's the expert, I'm not, but I was very pleased that uh, there is going to be I think, a very robust and thoughtful process around uh, looking at this issue, which I've been concerned about for the whole time I've been on the council, what to do about housing uh, the grass and population and making sure that we're not um, just giving money to grass to go out and compete with uh, residents in the rest of Cambridge. Um, so I'm very pleased, uh, I was very pleased to when I got a discussion with him, uh, Mr. Chair, to hear uh, how seri seriously he takes this charge. Also say I'm, I'm extremely pleased uh, that uh, just announced that he's going to allow um, well, the city to designate the liaison to interface with that committee uh, to facilitate communication between the city uh, to help make the process uh, to the city, uh, to its residents more transparent, to make sure that the city's concerns on how uh, you know, the impacts that MIT's approach to housing can have back on the residents of Cambridge. Uh, I know that this is a very significant uh, departure from the status quo uh, for what MIT does um, to, to invite somebody from the city onto uh, what, would, what has previously been you know, strictly an internal MIT only uh, uh, process and deliberate process. So I'm, I'm very good with this. I, to be honest with you, to Mr. Chair, I think this marks uh, with this new administration a new date, a new approach, and a new commitment to partnership with the city. Um, so I think that this is a uh, this is a huge step forward. Uh, it cannot be understated. Uh, so I'm very pleased with that. Um, I think I'm still uh, pressing you on the innovation space and the amount of innovation space uh, and what we're doing for entrepreneurs and for middle-sized companies. Uh, but I know that this you know this is a, just that we're not at the finish line yet. So but I wanted to take a moment just to recognize uh, the progress that has been done. Also very pleased uh, as well on the making notes here. Uh, the apprenticeship program, uh, we've been pressing for a while on how do we get uh, more Cambridge residents into the building trades. Uh, and I think with so much commercial, so much uh, proposed development in the proposal, I think thinking not just about what is going to be built, but how it's going to be built. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, the, the pathways to apprenticeship um, has been has been so so well thought through. Uh, I guess my Question then goes to the to the architect. Um, one of the, the issues I've talked about previously was um, I think the design of the buildings and most, more importantly, the design of the buldings to the residential corporate. Uh, how people, uh, this is the retail corporate, how people walking through may interact with the buildings and may feel the buildings. Uh, I guess going back to the, um, you know, the way that you're segmenting the buildings so that they don't feel like it's just one big monolithic thing. I don't think you can talk also about um, how the building meets the ground uh, and some of the new innovative things that may be happening, uh, happening around there. And I think that the other thing I was wanted to specifically ask was still on this MIT press building, I think still uh, has some concerns. I know that's more on a city, more a decision for the city council than it is uh, for you, but I think you could talk a little bit about the 100 square feet, and why, I guess the plaza being 100 square feet, why, what, how, what the impact is on a pedestrian who's strolling through, and why you know, that's an ideal number. Um, and then, I guess, I, this is just a random thought, I don't know if there's been any thoughts of if you, in trying to get to that 100 feet, could you keep like half the MIT Press building, or is that <laughs> not a developer goal, so I don't know if that's even a reasonable question to ask, but I'd love to you address that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you you uh, embedded three or four different questions in there, so let me try to take Mike up. Uh, let me start, and, and I think, um, especially uh, you, Russell, uh, has heard me say this several times, and I, I think the council has as well. Um, I think that a lot of modern architecture has failed on the street. 
uh, meaning that uh, modern buildings uh, very often hit the street in a way that is not particularly pedestrian friendly. And uh, I think that we have a, an obligation here, as in no other place, um, to change that, uh, to do that in a very positive and direct way. And we've talked with the planning board exactly what does that mean? Those are nice words, but what does that mean? And I think what it means is that we've got to have, some, and we have some very specific specific design guidelines around um, having setbacks above second or third or fourth floor and letting the architecture change as it comes down to the street and accommodate retail in a way that it's not ancillary to the building well. You know, what, what modern architecture has very often done in urban settings is beautiful, sleek, modern buildings coming to the ground uh, and then in a very ancillary kind of way, plugging in retail in that space that was designated on the plan. What we love about our cities, the, the best parts of our cities, is the, um, the, the kind of organic growth, um, the kind of diversity, and I always say the kind of messiness about these streets. We love streets being a little bit messy. Um, you, you know, think about the best retail streets you know, and you even think about streets like, um, you, you know, in Boston and Cambridge. Uh, they have a smaller scale, uh, they have a, there's a diversity of storefronts from one tenant to the next because the identity of the individual purveyor, whether he's making tacos or selling scarves, or it's a hardware store, um, they take on an identity that's in your mind and, and it creates a, a, a human pedestrian kind of scale. Maybe that's one story, maybe that's two stories, uh, maybe storefronts are wood lacquer, and maybe storefronts are brick, uh, and, but they're different, and they create a scale. And it, those of you who have seen, and I think everybody has seen, um, the, the kind of conceptual um, merchandising plans, the thought is these buildings will have multiple tenants on the ground floors, so that the entrance to the office or science space above will actually be very small. Um, and, and there's some very good guidelines around that, meaning that uh, a very high percentage of ground floor is retail, <coughs> that there are multiple tenants, there's multiple doorways, that these storefronts are not only transparent, but even operable. You know, that, that restaurants can spill out, even merchandise can spill out. That's what activates and makes good streets. And I think that, um, you know, these buildings are going to house the most advanced, um, uh, potentially house some of the most advanced science in the world. Uh, and yet they're, they're, and so they want to be modern buildings. Uh, and yet at the street they want to be pedestrian scale storefronts and street fronts and have a scale of 20, 30 feet of storefront, not 200 feet of storefront. Uh, that's what makes the, the, the pedestrian neighborhoods that we, we really like. Um, you asked about uh, the, the, the gateway, the portal. Um, and we have studied this um, a lot over the last couple of years, and we've studied it, as I think everybody knows, we've studied it with the MIT Press Building in place, um, and we've studied it with the MIT Press Building removed, and we've studied um, different versions in between. And, and the idea of uh, a partial building is not um, a, a crazy idea. It's, uh, it, it's an idea, frankly, that we studied. And, uh, uh, and, and I think that uh, all of those things are, uh, are possible. They have a series of different kinds of ripple effects. And the 100 feet that you're referring to, uh, if, if, uh, here's kind of the, the, the broad metrics of it. Um, if you look at what's there today, the, the T head house uh, sits uh, right, at where we, right at the head on axis of Carlton Street. And that's kind of the the, the axis that leads you into campus and connects to the infinite corridor in which MIT truly wants to make open and welcoming um, to everybody, everybody in that Kendall Square community as well as the surrounding community. Uh, the dimension today from that head house of the MIT Press Building is 22 feet. Um, you all know what it looks like. It looks like an alley. Um, and and uh, the our first, our, our, we, as you know, we've designated seven different building parcels, all of which correspond to surface parking lots. What we call parcel two 
which is the building that would be on the Cambridge Savings site and, and surface parking lot. Uh, if you, when you, when you uh, lay out the footprint of that building, uh, and then for a moment remove the, the head house building for the feet, the dimension you get for the MIT Press building is about 65 feet. And I know some people have thought that was too tight. Um, that it wasn't significant enough of a portal as an entry, as a gateway, as, as symbolic front door uh, or second front door to the, to the institute. Uh, one of the things here is that you know, MIT enjoys some extraordinary icons in, in the dome and killing the court, the infinite corridor. And so the obligation is to step up and do something of, of equal memorability. Uh, and so what we've, what we've looked at uh, if, if, in fact, you keep the MIT Press building, you build a new building on our site too, and you have that 65 feet, maybe you have to remove the head house, maybe you have to put it in the building, then you evaluate is 65 feet enough dimension, is that big enough portal? Um, if you completely remove the MIT building, now you're up around um, over 120, 130 feet, and it's probably too wide. And the reason I say that is, um, not that it's too wide as an urban gesture, it's too wide, I, in my opinion, um, and, and you've got some very good uh, other opinions here at the table, urban design opinions, uh, that we can keep it activated on a regular basis. So, you know, you think about, the, the, again, think about great spaces, and we've done lots of comparisons. You want a connection between the sides of these kinds of urban piazzas. You want them to, the, the, the activities to spill out and to activate on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock as well as Friday in the summer at 7 o'clock when you've got, you know, a thousand people there. Uh, so we said, I said, um, that, you know, that 100 foot dimension is a very nice dimension. It's a very nice metric. It can accommodate lots of activity. You can think of all sorts of things you can put in there uh, from a programming point of view across the year from food to book fairs to farmers markets to music to movies to all kinds of things gets too big it's, it, 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 it loses its intensity gets too small it's not on an appropriate scale so that that that's really kind of the big overview and, and that's really the task that is being um, undertaken by by this group uh, led by faculty uh, that will look at all of those possibilities. I think many of you have seen the ones that we've created with MIT, without, without, with MIT Press, uh, without MIT Press, uh, and, and we have looked at those things in between. Uh, and and, and, and it, it's com it, I think it's a complex planning issue. It's not a simple solution. It's not, it's not even either or. I think there's things in between. I, mean, yeah, I think you can think about, think about MIT Press transform. Um, the ground plane totally transformed and the ground plane of the press building and the exterior space merging and making it openable and expanding. Uh, I think what's important is, the most important thing is, that, that it's inviting, that it's, um, you know, a portal can be uh, open and welcoming or a portal can be um, um, exclusive and, and, and um, uh, a barrier. And clearly the intent here is open and welcoming. And it's not just we're making space, we're leading to the spaces beyond. It's a network of spaces. There's this piazza, there's the connection to the infinite corridor. The infinite corridor leads to Wadsworth. Wadsworth leads to the river. Wadsworth leads back to third. Third leads to, to, uh, to the Broad Canal. It's that, it's that network that we're really about. We don't want to build walls. We don't want to make portals that are um, that are barriers and connote exclusivity in any way. We want to make welcoming openings. It's a, it's a, um, it's a very challenging and very interesting and exciting urban design problem. Uh, and, and I think that the, 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 you know, the real message is, um, you, know, you know, designers, planners, architects, we live in a world of multiple solutions. Um, and I think that this exercise that's about the, the launch is really about broad view, be open-minded, think of all the possibilities. Um, don't think of, don't narrow it that, yes, MIT Press is in or MIT Press is out. MIT Press is transformed, partially removed, 
um, reinvented, um, um, made a little bit smaller, um, thought of as a canvas for all sorts of technology. All of those things, I'm um, sure, uh, will be part of the study that's to happen. I'm not sure I got, I think I, I think I covered all of the things that you were asking about. Yeah, Leland, a lot of did questions. You, can I follow up on this? The, there's two point. questions on this point. And, and for those of you who didn't hear when we started, David has to leave um, very soon, so we asked if people had questions about uh, from the architect that they asked them early on. So, do, do you mind if we? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll say my questions about that more in the CD after that session. So, Henrietta, we're going to Okay, so um, I'm really glad to hear you talking in, um, in very um, uh, important terms about this. Uh, I love to hear you say piazza, you know, the idea that this uh, gateway is an active space and it's really important to get it right and uh, make it workable for as many hours of the day and night as it seems useful to aim for. Um, and um, just one of my, my concerns right off was that that space might be, at this point, way too narrow. And then when I suddenly realized the headhouse dropped in there, I thought, there is no space. The head house takes it up. So, uh, so I just want to make sure that when whatever we pass in zoning allows that uh, that plaza, courtyard, whatever you want to call it, an entryway to, uh, you call it the entryway to MIT, but I think of it as a public courtyard for the uh, for the entire city and really the entire Kendall area. So um, in that um, in that vein, I uh, one of the things that I immediately saw in the model was something that made it look to me like the building, I don't know what you call it, number, is that number one? Building number one that's next to the savings bank <coughs> constrains the Main Street entrance. And so, I, and even in your language, I have to say, I heard you talk about how things connect up within Kendall, how it connects to the infant corridor, but I didn't hear the connection down Main Street. And um, that's, I think that is very significant and something that I'm, I'm concerned about. I don't know if you've looked at what having uh, that one building, is that the number, what you call number one building? No, it's number two. Number two building. Uh, that that uh, comes right up to the to the sidewalk. The sidewalk, I don't know is, if, if it's thought to be getting any bigger. Uh, if the, or if, as you look down Main Street, you, you see one building coming in this way, and another building, which actually on the other side, I think has a better step back um, uh, uh, appurtenance, if that's what it is. But, you know, where, where the legal seafood building and what's going to be Google actually steps back, this building on the right hand side comes right into the, um, right up against the sidewalk. And I, I'm very concerned that that building um, is unfriendly to uh, our connection from Central to Kendall, um, that it starts to close off the area instead of being welcoming. And I wonder if you thought about that. Yeah, I, and you make a, an excellent point, Mayor about, um Main Street as being primary, and, and you're absolutely right, it is primary. Everything comes off of Main Street. Main Street is the core. Uh, and then we, then we think about all of the connections to all of these other places. But if you don't get Main Street right, you know, we, we miss it. And you're right, Main Street is clearly the core. One of the good, very good things that's happening you know, on a parallel track is the replanning of Main Street, the metrics of Main Street, uh, and the plan as it is now um, actually uh, uh, removes the median in Main Street, um, creates, um, there is parallel parking today, but it actually creates more parallel parking, which I think is a very good thing for a pedestrian environment. Uh, and it makes the sidewalks wider. So in fact, so what, uh, do you know what the number is? Uh, it, it varies block to block, but it's at, at a minimum, I believe it's 16 feet, and I think it actually gets wider in some places. 16? 16. Now that's, that's building to fit it to curve. So, so actually what I would like um, after this meeting is to see the side of uh, the sidewalk. What, what are the sidewalks like as you come say from, from Tech Square? You know, what are we looking at the sidewalk widths and setbacks of buildings mm -hmm. so that that car, if you have a sense of that corridor and how, um, and I hope I'm wrong, that, that right now it just looks like it just, that one building just really pushes into it and takes away the sense of the grandness on Boulevard that you might have uh, in the harbor. And I'm sure there are ways to accommodate your buildings by dealing with that issue, but I, I don't want to see, I don't see how you can cut off Kendall Square from, from
from Central Main Street because you have all those other buildings that are doing things. But it's pretty hodgepodge going back past the road and the uh, and, and Whitehead. And if you don't tie all that stuff together, I think you're missing you're missing an opportunity and certainly uh, well, welcome. I mean, the gate it's not just a gateway to MIT we're talking about, though. I think that that's a truly wonderful idea. We're talking about a gateway from the rest of the city to Kendall. And you got gateways coming from Boston, but within the city, we're, we want to be welcoming also to get to Kendall. And uh, I want to make sure you've thought about that. We, we have all thought about that piece very carefully and not, uh, and, and not inadvertently said uh, this place is kind of walled off. Um, so that, that was one. Um, Actually, that was one and two of my questions. And there was, um, and maybe this isn't something that I need to ask you, but uh, one other kind of design question that was raised by uh, a letter that we got from Carol O'Hare O'Hare was about the heights along the river. And uh, right now, there are certain heights along the river and the zoning. Um, I'm not sure what this zoning uh, uh, does exactly to the heights along the river and how they change, what our expectations are, what those kinds of heights. So, um, and I know that at this point, um, yeah, so I, I don't know, is that a question for you? I could probably uh, comment on that. I think in, in the zoning regime that we put forward, the, the heights were intentionally organized to step down to the river, um, where the height proposed in the district along the river is 150 feet. Today, that district is 120. Um, for, for practical purposes, if you could, well, give you some perspective, I think one Memorial Drive, which is on, which starts that, is about like, 240 feet. So we're talking but, but it's about, an outlier. It, it's an outlier along the edge there. Yeah. So we're stepping down, well, obviously, okay. dramatically from, from that. I think uh, we've just obviously finished our slow building. We have an Anthony Little building that's down there. We have another which is a historic building. We have another historic building, or his, a building of historic interest at, um, at Sloan. Uh, we have the President's House, which is presumably a historic building, and Senior House. There are a number of uh, structures there that I think uh, will, will be as they are um, going forward. I think the opportunity may be slightly behind these, uh, or with some of the buildings that may be maybe not so historically oriented. Um, and the thought process was there might be something along there that bumps up a little bit more than 120 feet. And, and that was the intention of how we sort of designed that district going forward. So. I think we're very concerned, and we've been, you know, really have been stewards of making sure that Memorial Drive and the river have been very thoughtful in our production of, of, of any space along there over time. I think we're very proud of what we've done at the Sloan School as well. Uh, the notion that there might be some variety and the opportunity to reconfigure the floor plates, which some of them, frankly, are not that hospitable today. You know, I think 100 Memorial Drive, it was designed with its back towards Kendall Square and block off from the river. You know, in the future, at some point in time, that could change. Maybe there's a way to <coughs> Forest, but that might come in exchange for bumping up one element of it in order to get some more transparency through the space there. That was the intention, to try to create some flexibility to enable uh, some, some movement in that area. Um, so I, I think that was, that's the notion. Thank you. Um, make it, and then if there's any other, I want to respect your time, and I know we're going beyond where you are, so uh, if there's anybody else that has a quick question for David after that, but otherwise. So this, these are just comments related to actually the first question that you answered of um, Councillor Chunk, which had to do with how do you activate the first floor retail space. So I think we can all agree, well maybe I shouldn't say that, uh, that one candle as it is right now um, has huge sidewalks on the on the Broadway side. And aside from Five Grand Saints, I don't know that anyone would really say that that's really activated retail. And part of that is the location right there, busy coming off uh, the bridge, you know, all those sorts of things. But it was kind of planned. What was what was built was planned with an eye towards this is set up so that it could become activated space along the Broadway side, along the Third Street side. But it didn't really work except for fire and things, which is recent. But when you go around the back side of the building, you want to know what that little thing is called by Broad Canal. That Broad Canal Way. Way. Broad Canal Way. Okay, when you go along there, there's, you know, zero. There's nothing. There's a parking um, garage. It's, it, and then on the other side of, of um, Broadway, one canal way, whatever it's called, um, again, there's that attempt with the huge sidewalk. So 
so that Zah can spill out onto the, and that works, except unfortunately they're looking at the uh, back of the parking. So it, it's really exciting to me that there's so much effort put into how do you activate that one Kendall Square, one um, Broadway block. Um, so I'm going to challenge you. I know that you've built quite a lot of buildings in Cambridge. So I want to hear from you an example of something where you as the architect have been able to design the first floor or the, you know, one, the two floors of the building so that it's just completely conducive to being an active pedestrian experience. So in Cambridge, where have you, where do you view the success of the architect being able to activate the first floor? Sure. Um, first, um, I think you make a very good point. Sidewalks can be too wide, um, and if they're not um, populated with enough activity, uh, they can be too wide and, and they dissipate energy rather than collect energy, and we want to collect energy. Now, I can show you some places around the country where wide sidewalks, where streets have been taken over and created very wide sidewalks, and it works great because there's Lincoln Road in, in, um, in South Beach is a great example where all of the seating came out uh, away from the storefronts. They occupy a lot of space. There's a lot of energy, uh, and, it's, and it's very successful. But what you're pointing to in front of One Broadway, in front of uh, Watermark, those are wide, very wide sidewalks, and it's been hard for everybody to, to really generate the activity, that uh, the, the sense of energy that you really want there. So I, it, it, there is a... Um, I think there is a kind of sweet spot, um, and this isn't all about restaurants, um, and it's also about retail, it's about shops, it's about diversity of things, and so um, I think you, you can, um, too wide can be, can be um, not, not, it's not necessarily better. I think the best thing about Broad Canal Way is we're taking something, we propose to take something that's one-sided and make it two-sided, and that's transformative. The best retail, you can find examples, but the best retail in the world is two-sided. And it has this kind of oscillation from side to side. Think about the best shopping streets in the world, they're always, uh, almost always two-sided. Uh, so, so challenge me to, my, to, to where that has worked. Um, I guess the, the best example I can think of in a modern building um, is the, uh, the uh, where flower and, and uh, the bottle shop have come uh, at the base of 200 Mass Ave. Um, it took a long time to get there. But what they have done is, um, they're both well-designed shops. We have nothing to do with the design of the shops. But, but um, they're, they're not too deep. You can see the back. They're, they're, Flower takes their tables outside. Um, the, the wine store um, is, is well illuminated, so it activates the, the edge. There's a kind of scale um, that keeps your eye down to the first floor. Now, I won't, I won't say that that's um, the best you can do. I think you can do much better than that. I think, you know, where we get, where, to defend my profession, where, where we get in trouble is that um, very often corporate users are trying to make a corporate statement with architecture. And I think what MIT is saying, and, and thrilled about it is we've got a commitment to the street here and so we don't have to make this statement that comes to the ground and have a grand entry. Um, we're going to dedicate the, the ground floor of these buildings is going to belong to the street in its use and its architecture and its permeability and all of those things. That's a, you know, to me, that's a incredibly welcomed and refreshing point of view. You know, not all developers will think that way and not all corporate users will think that way because they have different agendas for what they want architecture to do. And I think what you're getting here is, is an agenda that says making place is at the top of our list. And making place means diversity and messiness at the ground level. I mean, we like, we, we like cities that are a little bit messy, that are a little bit disorganized, where every awning isn't the same as every other, and every glade sign isn't the same as every other. I don't know if I would call that messy, but I would call that interesting. Yeah. Um, 
And, and I would agree about uh, perhaps the sidewalk in front of the heart of one Broadway is maybe too big, especially in the winter when you can't really sit out there. But it also gives you use for you know, the hubway stations, you know, so there are other things that you can put in there. Your example of um, the Navarro's building on um, Mass Ave, the, the central bottle and flower, is probably an example of the sidewalk that's too small. Because it's, it's, you know, it's not pleasant to be sitting outside in the street with the, the cars going by. So there's probably some sweet spot, who knows um, exactly what that is, but we haven't hit it. But I didn't hear an answer to my question about something that you, as an architect, have able, been able to create that embodies what we're trying to capture with this liveliness on the first floor. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, my best examples are not going to be Boston, Cambridge examples. My best example is if you're looking specifically for our Well, this is international, so we can go with it. <laughs> yeah, not, <laughs> not international, but, but, it, but it's a nice trip. Um, uh, work we've done in Los Angeles at the Grove in Los Angeles, where there's all of that diversity, and you'll find it, you know, there's a website. Um, it, it, and it does go to all these things I'm talking about in terms of open space and public realm as part of the pedestrian experience. And I think, I, I want to come back because I think you're, you're getting at the same thing the mayor is getting at. We've got to think about this as common ground. Um, we've got to think about this as where all of these different things come together. That's what's going to make it. So you've, you've, you've built so much in Cambridge and you haven't, you, you can't think of a local-ish example of that first floor really embodying, no. Well, it, it, but that it wasn't really what? your the concept when it was built. You didn't feel that the building, you were asked to incorporate these features that would allow the first floor to be activated. You, you hadn't been given that charge before. In fact, sometimes the opposite. Um, the, the ground floor of these buildings is so valuable for science because of, for code reasons. Um, you can do you can do things on the first in the first 65 feet that you can't do in other parts of the building that has to do with um, chemical storage, basically. And and so um, the, the ground floor is so valuable in the in the development world that um, the the dedication of space to retail um, it is is uh, has a negative. Um, revenue impact. It's negative to the developer's pro forma, um, and, and it's you know again, it's all about it's all about what your, the priorities of your agenda. If if you're the pri if, if your agenda is we want to make a great place because a great place will benefit everybody. Uh, it will bring more people. It will bring more Navarrises. You know, it will bring more of that kind of activity. It will enhance collaboration and interaction. Then you say, okay, I'm willing to say I'm not putting science on the ground floor. I'm putting things that are common ground on the ground floor. And, and I, I got to tell you, that's a very um, uncommon, unusual charge in the development world um, because it doesn't it doesn't flow to the pro forma. Also, I would suggest that in David's defense on some of this, David uh, serves his clients very well. Uh, we have, and he is right, the science, the importance of the lower floors are critical to what goes on in the building. So there is a trade-off between what science happens and what retail happens as you do this. We have started this planning process with that as a paramount goal. Uh, the retail components, uh, the whole notion of activating 75% of our ground floor, we spent an enormous amount of time with people that have developed retail. We looked at so many different spaces. We had uh, opportunity to spend an enormous time with the leadership uh, of the people who did Quincy Market. Uh, we looked at you know Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Newburyport, all these interesting places, Harvard Square, places where it wasn't the it wasn't the City Hall Plaza in, in Boston, where you know it was intimate spaces, interesting spaces, mix of old and new, always getting their interest about going around the next corner. And we were cautioned by many of these professionals, not necessarily in architectural trades, but in, in the development of retail and placemaking, that the mix and the, the dimensions have to be carefully thought out, and they're not always these large spaces. The, the ones that have been successful have been more interesting and diverse. Uh, and, and, and if I look through over time where I've gone myself and enjoyed places, they have been these interesting, quirky places. And we're trying to, in, in the organizational space, 
recreate some of that, which is actually why some of these historic buildings are very interesting, <coughs> and some of the new spaces complementing them, and the, and the way the pathways that connect through. I, I think we have a, 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 an amazing diversity of opportunity to create different types of spaces throughout, throughout this district. So another quick, quick question about the Grove um, place, was it, in Los Angeles? Just, just the Grove. Grove. So you were given the charge of focusing on the, the ground. A absolutely. It's all about place making. Okay. Yeah, it's, about, it's about retail and restaurants. But, it, and then, you know, but LA is, is a city that lacks place in many ways. And this was all about making place, creating um, public realm on private property um, that would attract people for no specific revenue generating uh, reason. But of course the benefit is you attract the people and, and, and you know it's, it, it does generate revenue for all sorts of different reasons. Okay. So and then a quick question to the planning department. How did the first can I get can you hold me? that for one minute okay. just because David has to leave. Mm -hmm. Ken has a quick question. Just a uh, I realize I missed part of the discussion, but I do think uh, I just want to weigh in on the other side because I think the historic buildings in Kendall have uh, <clears throat> been resurrected as a plus. I, I really think Kendall, I, from this Boston Consulting Group study, that Kendall and the environment are a, a sort of the most innovative square mile in the universe. Given the particular historic structures other than the one with the tower, I don't know why Kendall would just become a new place, an innovative place, and a modern place. I'm somewhat discouraged to hear the discussion that some of these square-like places can be too large, because I think you're, you're referencing the wrong ones. The most successful one I've ever seen is the one that's around the Sumter George Pompidou in Paris, where they go in and they have the fountain. And mm -hmm. It's always vibrant, and there's no retail. It's a people place. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why, given all the intelligence at the table and the money, there isn't more creativity present in conceptualizing what we can have in Kendall Square, I mean, and through K2C2 and all of that, a, a vision has not appeared. And I'm almost feeling I'm being asked to vote on some volumes, but then someone who is creative is going to figure out a way to make a place there. But that, that's wholly lacking in this discussion. And I think when you get tied to these existent nondescript already raped buildings, it is really um, disheartening to anybody with a creative gene in them that that's the best that we can do given what the possibilities here are. So I don't know if I'm in the minority or the majority on this, but I absolutely know that tying whatever is new here to what exists now is, is going to give us nothing much. And if all of this is to get to nothing much, I, I wish I had an extra hour of sleep, I would say. Now, the other point, and uh, Mayor Davis would have helped me with this, there's not a lot of discussion about how Central, Kendall, and Harvard Square radiate as three points of, of the city. And I'm fully convinced that each has a, a, is a personality of its own. But much of what the Kendall discussion has to be on is what is the personality of Kendall? And I gotta tell you that for all the money that's at the table, no one, I mean, we've discussed retail, but this grander vision of, so we vote whatever, and what do we get? It is no clothes on. It's a skeleton. And, I'm beginning to worry about that because it seems to me we've been at this long enough to be able to come up with some notion that we're trying to, even if we were replicating something, but there is, it's just that, so the best of these pictures has a big circle on which God knows what happens. Um, my 
played friend Ruth Betts and you said not good enough. I, I just don't know why we can't seem to get an actual vision of what it would be, either a campus thing or a square thing, but it, it, it's, it's a void. And um, I agree, retail isn't the only thing. Now the last thing I want to say is this, the one gift Clearly, Clancy brought they said that Kendall Square needs 4,000 units of housing to keep it vibrant and have people there. And people are, for me, the source of vibrance. But this entire pro proposal is not to bring more people. So that's sort of a, a, a disconnect that's significant. If we had a lot more units of housing, we could see who might be on the plaza, but we're not bringing a lot more units of housing. Well, nor have we said that in the future that's our plan. So, I, I, you know, it, it um, I will just revert to something I said at the time I visited your new location there, that um, it, it, it does seem that, well, I'm getting what that thing was I was going to say, I, I guess, I, I, I'm not fully convinced that, they, oh, I know what I was going to say, they, you have some successful spaces at, uh, MIT, places like Killian Court, which I think are really underutilized. Um, I'm hopeful that this uh, end of the campus and of the city could really define a place more than these discussions have uh, entailed. And I, for one, am not necessarily encouraged that there's going to be a kind of faculty group that is now going to look at the issue of MIT's face, because I, I'm not sure that some of the faculty-based housing that exists is necessary, or in the housing building, as we go through this river thing and point out this was a faculty member, that was a faculty member. Uh, I'm not sure that's our solution either. I, I, I think we really do need one big creative mind to sort of say, Here's what this could be. So, I'm going to Mr. Jack. Uh, Councilor, I was trying to follow you here and sort of looking around the room. Did, did you really use the word raped buildings or did you say raked? I said raped because what it is, that the, the facades have been. No, but rape is a term that is not used to describe physical buildings. Councilor. No, I'm not trying to follow you, Councilor. I'm honestly. They, they, they have been. Um, with the The historical something had been removed. There's it's plenty of other words. Removed. Stripped. Stripped. Okay. Fine. I'm, I'm just asking you to please be sensitive that that is a word that um, most people don't use to describe buildings. It's described as to use violent acts against people. Well, I think stripped is it's controversial too. But I would ask Well, I, I do think that there's, a, <laughs> there's not a difference here. I'm I sorry. Do, I want to follow you, but I'm still just stuck. I said that those <laughs> terms simply <laughs> have to <laughs> be <laughs> 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 Uh, they have been, the historic references have been removed. Okay, clearly you don't want to acknowledge that I think it's an insensitive That's word. Not, I'm willing to accept well, that. I, 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 I disagree with you. Yes, I agree with you. It's not my analysis. There's a lot of people who would be really offended by that. But I, I understand that you disagree with me. I withdraw my so, presence so from the room. I think that you are waiting, and I'm going to say that at this point, if, if the question isn't specific to David, we're going to let Mr. Manfredi leave. No, it sounds like I, I, I like this one out because I think a lot of questions that are being raised aren't specific to the architect. I think they're being specific about the use. Yes, yes. So. Go ahead. Thank you. I was, can I just make one, one point? I, I, I like um, Councilor Reed's example of uh, the plaza at Um I, I think that, and, and it's a great space, and it's a big idea. But she, the, and it's carved out of the city. And it's, it's one of the most fascinating things about it, a couple of fascinating things. One is the juxtaposition of some of the most extraordinary modern architecture against a historic fabric. That's what strikes you as you, you lay in that square. You don't actually sit in it, you lay in that square. And also the program. Um, it is an eventful place. You go there when you visit because you know that something's spilling out on top of you that day. It always does, and it's programmed, and I think that's so important for what we're, what we want to do here is 
create a space that is programmable and programmed every day. Uh, and, 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 and as you know, we've been working with Dan Biederman, who's responsible for the programming at, at uh, Bryant Park. He literally says every day, I can program this space every day. And I think that's absolutely essential to, to making great places. Thank you. If, if I could just say this too. What I find there is that the fountain, because it is so, it's always moving, is a thing that draws people in. And I've never been there when anything from the computer center has filled out. It's just that it's so interesting. I think a lot of people with small kids bring them there because it's going to entertain them. And it's its own interesting thing. I mean, when we were building University Park, I mentioned to those folks that, you know, if you want to bring in people from Mass Ave, you have to have somebody back, something back there that people want to see. That didn't happen, and you see what we got. So I, I, there have got to be some more creative ideas than we have seen about how you bring in people to Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess I have a number of questions. Um, you know, I, I think the thing that Council Reeves uh, alluded to is something that I continue to be concerned about, and I have several questions, is that, um, you know, when I did this tour well over a year ago, and I walked around for three hours, and, and sort of looked at the physical space of Kendall Square, and looked at how it could actually be reoriented and look at the um, the possibilities of, of what could be developed there. Um, and they were mostly non-academic possibilities. Um, I found it really interesting. I found it really exciting. Um, but I think the challenge is that we sort of saw this um, this picture a number of years ago. And in fact, when I went down to the live models, I asked, are those the same pictures that you showed us? And you know, at one point, it was being touted as potential mother um, uh, Samuel Hall, but something for Cambridge. I, I think my issue continues, there's, there's a number of issues, but one of the issues I continue to worry about is really how, how do we know that this is going to be a vibrant space? Not only through its design, but really through its use and then the guarantees that we get with that. Um, the, the other thing I would have a question, the first I'm going to ask CDD, did I have asked for there to be prepared a list, of, a, 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 a culmination of, of concerns that have been raised in public meetings? Do, do we have that? And are we using that as a basis for some of this conversation? I haven't heard it yet, but I was in and out earlier, so. We've prepared a list that we can share that with you. Well, I think it's been really important that we, if this is our conversation amongst each other as a council, it's probably the best chance we're going to have, as many of us here, to really use that list and have a conversation amongst ourselves. Um, I, I also have to say, I, Say. One, when I did that tour a year ago, I found it really interesting. I still find it really interesting. What could be developed there? I'm not so committed that it has to be MIT academic use. I do have questions about what is the academic use that you foresee in the future, and where do you foresee using that? I, I'm, I'm not so interested in you continuing to go out and sort of accumulate additional land um, because you then decide you need to do more academic programming. So I am concerned about sort of how we, as a council, look at the releasing of this land to non-academic use, which on its face, I don't have a, a, an issue with. Um, and there are some people who do, legitimately so. Um, but I, I am concerned about sort of the guarantees that we're going to get around sort of what additional space are you seeing that you need in the future, and where are you currently, what, what do you already own that you will use that on? I think the other issue that has come up here, thank you for this, the other issue that has come up here, just for people who don't know, I had asked at Monday's council meeting that CDD put together a list of all of the issues that have come up in public comment about questions and, and problems that people um, have expressed with not wanting this to go forward so that we could have that conversation based on that as well. Um, I also don't, on its face, have a problem with there being um, housing being built there that's not yours. I think the, the questions of the council to have, the conversation is, there are some thoughts out there that somehow, if we, if MIT is one that's not housing all its graduate students that it needs to, and it still seems to be some real debate about that. Um, two, that there are so many housing pressures in our neighborhoods, particularly in the surrounding neighborhoods of Area 4, and um, maybe some of East Cambridge, and 
they became a sport, um, that there's, there's an overwhelming number of graduate students living there, that that's part of the lack of affordability in the city. Um, and I think it's important that we have intelligent conversations and debates about that, because intuitively, my response has been, I'm not convinced that if we were to remove all of the graduates in our neighborhoods into graduate housing, that somehow we would see um, a decrease, um, a, either a, um, a, stag, a, a, a freezing of rents as they currently are, that they therefore wouldn't continue to go up in the future, or that that would make the housing market more affordable, or that people wouldn't continue to rent at the rates they are, and even renting them to professionals who are doing living together as twos and threes. Um, so I think that that's something here I would like for us, and I'd like for our housing people to chime in on that. The idea that housing would be built there um, is interesting to me, because it is one of the surest ways that we expand affordable housing, and that's not insignificant. And when I look at the number of units, based on what we now have under inclusionary, still 50 to 60 units is not insignificant. However, I will say that I am going to press, because I, I've said to people also, the good thing about MIT being the owner slash developer of this is that I actually it, it have come to prefer, in some ways, some of the universities being the developer that I deal with as opposed to a private developer, to think that there's more flexibility, there's more of a, um, ability for the council to really have a say on sort of how what things get shaped physically and, and uses and what gets there. And we're dealing with people who aren't taking property and have in, in meetings. So I think that gives us greater accountability. Um, that said, I want you to know that I'm actually going to be looking and pushing for you to put more affordable housing there. This is an opportunity. If housing is going to go there, um, and I do support the inclusionary model there, and um, you're certainly fulfilling that as the, the law currently dictates, but this is an opportunity also for MIT to step up and make a commitment to more affordable housing. I've put um, a lot of pressure on, on Harvard over the last year. Um, they continue to talk about their 2020 program that started 14 years ago that delivered um, 10 million to the city of Cambridge and 10 million to Boston. And um, they have said, well, that's our contribution. And I said, that is not enough. It was 14 years later. We then entered into negotiations where they actually made it possible for one of our nonprofits to buy Chapman Arms in Harvard Square by making sure that the land that they owned on that building was not um, leased to, to a private developer, making it a desirable place to invest in. And then I think what's really exciting is that Councilor Reeves and I get to announce today that HRI is going to be the buyer of Two Mile Auburn. Now, I'm still not happy about that because that will still mean that public dollars are going into the purchase of a building and the improvement of a building that Harvard committed to owning and maintaining. Um, at least our legal understanding is, is in perpetuity. That's how it got developed. So now I'm looking at sort of the standards I'm going to hold MIT to. And I really want you to see this as an opportunity to really reinvest in affordable housing in Cambridge. And I'd like to see a much larger number than what I currently see. Um, so that, that's sort of one thing. But I think the issue of sort of, you know, the demand, are there 5,000 MIT students that, you know, need to be housed by MIT? Should this be the place that, that we put them? I, I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, but what, what is the graduate housing population, and because we're focusing on MIT right now, doing to the, um, the affordability of the Cambridge? Those are, let's have conversations and, and not sort of just throw them out there as it's true or it's not true. Um, and then I would ask, I think um, Chairman Marr asked at the last ordinance meeting, I have asked you and I have had my meeting with you um, last week, where is this additional land that you would use if in fact your housing study says that you need to for graduate housing? Where is it? And then I also want to know the, what you charge your graduate students. I'd like to know what, the, what those comparable rents are. Because one of the other issues with it is that they don't rent, I think you're always going to have a population of graduate students who don't want to live in your graduate housing. And that's just sort of, that was my experience as a graduate student in the city. Um, but then also you make it, um, you make it affordable enough and, and maybe they will choose you, in fact, um, even if it's not their first desirable place. So I think what you charge for rent is really critical. Um, I will also say, I just saw a group of our nonprofits walk in and my stomach, my stomach stank a little bit here because the other thing that's sort of floating out here is the community benefits package. And what I want to say in the conversations I've had is that the community benefits package for me is never the deciding factor of whether or not this is development or the support. It's 
does what's being proposed make sense for the city and our neighborhoods, not sort of what is the cost of the sale of this development. So just even our nonprofits that are there. I, I know there's been a variety of conversations with individual counselors. There is nothing on the table that is promising any nonprofit anything. Um, what is on the table is has been the number, and I think 10 million is one of the numbers I have heard of, of dollars coming to the city. What is still up for debate, I believe, um, is this idea of sort of who holds that bank check of that. Um, there was one version which MIT holds it, which I have said I absolutely do not support. Um, community benefits and dollars comes directly to the city. The city is in charge and elected to understand the needs of the community and decides how to spend that money, not MIT or any other developer. But also to just all of our nonprofits here, I, I want to appreciate all the work you do and your invested interest in, in how the city uses community benefits, which we haven't even decided yet. We haven't been able to get it together in two years to figure out how to use community benefits because of our own internal debate. But I want to be clear, that should not be um, in the middle of this debate because this land is not for sale for community benefits. I, in the end of its face, I don't have uh, intuitively a problem with the, uh, this property being revitalized for commercial use and housing use and not all going to academic and campus use. I really think the tax dollars that we will get from that becoming actually something which is nothing at the moment is interesting. The opportunity to build more affordable housing in market housing is, is also interesting to me. And um, so, and then I just want to throw out one final thing that, uh, and then I, I hope that I'll come back and raise more of the issues that have been raised and help my colleagues as well. And then again, I want to thank you guys for putting this together. Um, but that this notion of sort of how much housing is too much housing in our city, and, and I think that's something that CDD really needs to sort of have some thoughts on it and reflect to us. Um, you know, one report says we need 4,000 units, and other, other people are saying we need 5,000 units of graduate housing. Um, you have the governor trying to build 10,000 units of housing um, throughout the state and not finding it easy to do. Um, with that said, I'm going to ask my colleagues, I hope they'll join me in my next council resolution where I did challenge the governor who says he wants to build 10,000 units of housing in Cambridge, yet we saw the courthouse in Cambridge go to a developer that is building no housing. And my conversation with the governor has been that that may not be a done deal and that we all need to weigh in on if, if housing is something that many of us care deeply about. So um, those, those would be some of the questions I initially had. So if, if I can do two things, but in, in, you can answer how you want to answer the event. On the issue of the graduate housing and the location of graduate housing is the first thing I ask you to do. And then I'm going to ask the city manager to pick up on the issue that Marjorie just raised about the tax implications. Um, and then any other questions that were came up. Marjorie, more comment on, yeah. were you talking about location and maybe the study and some of that? I think if I just might phrase that just in a simple way that, that you know, the issue has been raised repeatedly that, that as you look at this PUD district, in, in so the mixed use that we're seeing here, of retail and commercial space with the academic use in the back, some folks have thrown out the question, why not all graduate student housing? And I think the, the, that what Marjorie's just saying is, is that, is this the right place? Where else on campus can graduate housing be built? And, and if that helps frame that question. Yeah, it does. So um, let me just make a few comments. So, you know, a number of my faculty colleagues have said to me, Marty, why don't we just build a bunch of graduate dorms and be done with this? And uh, I've been asking our institutional resources staff to really generate some data, which I fully anticipate uh, Chancellor Clay's uh, working group is going to really delve into and think about this. But I actually put together a, a set of uh, information for the faculty forum we had on campus this week, and I decided to write it up in the form of a memo, which I can share with you. Um, but let me just, oh, sure. Um, let me just uh, uh, say a few things, which is that um, um, there's, there's sort of, there's, we do a number of surveys of our graduate students. We, we track uh, uh, the lottery system for use of graduate student housing on campus. And, and just let me give you four points, and then I'll tell you why I'm giving you those four points. So since 1998, uh, we've um, grown our graduate student population by 19%. That's a that's 1,020 new graduate students. Uh, 811 of those 
of that increase has been absorbed in the increase in on-campus housing. And so the the uh, the bound the rest, the 200 or so, have moved off campus. That's the increase in graduate students uh, outside of campus. Um, in 2012, we were able to offer housing to 84% of the graduate students that asked to live on campus. Uh, and, and in 2011, we offered housing to 91% of the graduate students that requested to live on campus. Um, we also do survey. In the 2011 survey, we asked graduate students that live off campus, what are the top two reasons that were factors in your decision to live off campus? And more than 50% of indicated that they wanted to live away from MIT as one of either their first or second reason. And, and lastly, if you ask them in general how are they satisfied with the availability of housing, 79% indicate they're either somewhat satisfied or very satisfied. Why do I bring this information up? Not to suggest that there isn't an issue that we have to address, there is. But the, to suggest that the answer, I think, is nuanced. Uh, and, that, and that putting all of, or establishing all of our housing stock for our residents on campus may lead to empty beds. And so uh, that's why we play, place a lot of importance in the working group that Chancellor of Clay is, is going to be leading. And, and in particular, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Councilor Chung's work with Professor Clay, because I think this identification of a liaison to the city, I think, is going to help ensure that whatever we develop in terms of recommendations for housing is sensitive to its impact on the city. So I'm, I'm excited about that. It's a new model for us. I'm optimistic that we're going to develop some, some good solutions there. Let me, let me complement this on the issue of where that may go. Because I think clearly this frames that, that the answer from Professor Clay working group will be very important in determining where that may go. Uh, but what's important to us as, as guiding um, parameters for our planning purpose um, is that in the past 10 to 12 years, we have invested in building housing on the west end of the campus. Um, as you know, we have built all these uh, number of beds in the basically Cambridge Port area on the west side. And that's an area that we, we have strong interest in, in keeping the developing for several reasons. Um, one of it is that we want we have a, a strong interest in strengthening the community, the living community and the residential community that we have been forming, both for the undergraduate students as well as the graduate students and, and visiting students that are housed on the west. Um, the, the third one that you have heard here is that, that the parcel and, and what we're looking at at Kettle Square has an enormous value to our science and technology mission driven uh, for MIT, both for academic uses as well as for potentially commercial uses. And, and we have um, an interest in preserving as much as possible the capacity in that area for those uses. Um, having said this, then, um, if we focus on the West, um, we have um, a significant development capacity for residential purposes, and let me just highlight a few more. Um, a particular one that's an interesting and intriguing one for that is the, what we call the Westgate lot. This is a parking lot together by the Westgate units. There's a tall unit in the um, semi-tower by the end of Vassar Street. Um, that would be a perfect area for a potential housing need. And again, it all depends on what the housing study may or may not um, give us in terms of what types of units, um, the balance of units, and if they need or not an increase um, of developing capacity. Um, we have several parcels along Vassar Street, towards the end of Vassar Street, towards the, the west of Memorial Drive End, um, that are also interesting um, potential sites for residential development for our student housing. And certainly in Cambridge Port, which there has been Sydney Pacific development and, and, and the uh, new Washington House of Radio students have been placed, as well as a renovation of the warehouse building. That's another area in which we are building the infrastructure for the campus. So from, from a planning perspective and from an interest in developing those residential communities, that keeps being an area in which we have development capacity there um, by the end of the athletic fields and then north towards Cambridge Port. The other aspect, moving to the east, and, and we're very happy to preserve and also have some incentives thanks to the planning board of building housing um, on the east on the QD5 district, is that when we have preserves our flexibility, that if the work of the working group determines that that more housing or a different type of housing is needed and the east part may be actually an attractive area, we could build housing there as well. 
Um, but so, so from a planning and from an institute perspective, we feel served with the land and the capacity we have to build residential um, if we are going to be um, based on the, on the demands and the analysis that Professor Clay will, will deliver to us. So on the, on the cost side, we are working on, on having the comparable analysis because part of the, um, the difficulty in this comparability is that, that the offer that we have is, let me call it an all-in offer, with lots of services included in the rental price. So what we want to work um, with that is that the, the, the level of pricing for each one of the units needs to be in a way unbundled um, for really rent, comparing with one bedrooms of studios in Cambridge that may or may not include cable and other utilities. Um, so that's, a, that's work that we have um, on board. Mr. Chair, for you, I guess my, my question is if you could just be a little bit more direct. If I'm looking at renting a two bedroom in Cambridge in the private market versus renting a two bedroom um, in graduate housing, which one's more affordable for me? Assuming, let's assume no cable, no nothing, which is not really a direct answer. Is it more affordable to rent in the private market in Cambridge? Um, I, I can't imagine, but I'd like to know what the difference is. But that, goes, that, that contributes to how graduate students decide where to live. Sure. I, I, I don't know if you, I, I don't have the, um, the data to, here available with me to tell you that, but the two bedroom in Cambridge, the bedroom really we're in Cambridge, we're looking at uh, the two bedroom in Cambridge close to the campus, which would be our um, kind of comparable. Um, I do believe it's more affordable to be at MIT. Okay, I, I would ask someone to get that information to me before we leave today, because I would have to think that that's something that, if it were really that much of a difference, that somebody here would know that. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure it's not a part of what you're looking at, but somebody has to know that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just ask Bob to just pick up on the um, tax implications, that issue that was raised, and I, I know that you have done some analysis there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and in keeping with a long-standing tradition, I do not do zoning, but I do do revenue projections. <laughs> and I, I do want to say that, uh, in addition to all the important items that are being discussed here, that uh, this project certainly has the capacity to provide an additional tax base for the city that will stand it in good stead in the uh, years to come. I think as the council knows, MIT is currently our largest um, taxpayer, paying more than 0.5% of all of the commercial taxes. Their annual tax payment uh, to the city currently is $36.5 million. Um, if you look at this project with estimates, and I believe Paul was handing out a very simplified sheet that shows the current value of the properties uh, that are under consideration for rezoning, a uh, estimate of value of the property were to be rezoned and what it would pay on taxes, uh, commencing with a valuation uh, that's we'll probably have Steve. Uh, Collapsing but on 1114, um, the new value on vacant parcels would uh, kick in, and then the new value has built out. Essentially, would add ten and a half million dollars to the uh, thirty-six million dollars in, in taxes that MIT now pays on, on, on full build out. Uh, with that in perspective, that more than funds the entire Cambridge Police Department for the entire <laughs> year. Uh, if you take the operating budget, if it were all to come uh, from from taxes, so from a fiscal financial stability perspective, uh, clearly there is a huge advantage. That 10.5 million dollars comes on an annual payment. It's not the Community benefit fund is being described uh, as, uh, and certainly under the kind of discussion. So I just want the council to be aware that there are uh, this project, besides all of its other benefits, allows the city to feel comforted with what would be the new growth in valuation each year for the next several years. And I think those of you who have sat through the October discussion about setting the tax rate, you know that new value is the single largest component of keeping the residential 
tax rate down. So I have the information passed out in a very simple form, but clearly from a financial perspective, uh, there's uh, an advantage in all the other issues that the council must wrestle with as they do zoning, you, you will wrestle with, but I wanted you to see the financial implications, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I have, uh, hang on one second, uh, Marjorie, you're done. I'm out. I have uh, uh, Minka and then Leela. Uh, I was going to continue my question about the um, activation of the of the, um, of the first floor, but since you presented now some interesting information, I wanted to take the opportunity to ask you questions about it specifically. Um, but just one quick thing, does this include an estimate of personal property that would be within the buildings? So is that included or is this just for the value of the buildings? This is value of vacant land initially, which will be the value of the buildings as they are built out. I didn't hear but it. But it, it doesn't include an estimate of the personal property within the buildings? No, it also it's not, that's okay. not certainly there's that's potential not. for growth in the personal property, but I, I don't know if there's any way to estimate that. Okay. And this is just for the you know, so-called seven parking lots that are currently being viewed. I mean, it's, it's just that cursory of a, um, of a look at what the increase is going to be. Okay. So one brought away and usually, okay. And does it take into account the fact that in the petition, um, if the building that was you know, built as a commercial building, if 75% of it becomes used by academics, then the whole building gets off the tax roll. Does, did you factor that in here? No, the assumptions here are up for all of the FAR that's uh, permitted on these parcels would be in uh, commercial, 20% residential and 80% of the total square footage would be commercial. That's not a an academic discount. Uh, and it's all it's all it's all uh, taxed at the commercial rate. Twenty eight percent commercial, twenty percent residential. So the institutional. Oh well, okay, but the, okay. Um, to allow money. Um, I I don't have any more questions. I just want to, if anyone else has questions about this particular issue. Otherwise, I would go back to other questions that I have on different topics. Go, go, go ahead and ask the question, because I think that Councilman um, Chung, who is next, is uh, necessarily pertinent to this. Well, I'm just thinking, if other councilors have questions about this specific piece of information. Just, just, okay. just go ahead. Right. Okay, good. Um, so then I want to go back to the, the activating the, the retail, because as uh, Council Decker so eloquently said, that's kind of one of the of the exciting pieces that comes to the people of, of Cambridge, um, as well as the students at MIT. So, as far as I read the zoning ordinance itself, they're really the attempts in the zoning to create to activate the first floor have to do with 75% uh, of that storefront has to be retail restaurants. That's one like, tangible thing that's in there. There has to be an entrance to the sidewalk. That's another tangible thing that's in there. And they have to have a consultant that will help them with retail. And then it lists what the active uses would be. Um, consumer, uh, museum, exhibit space. Is that enough? Because, um, you know, we, we sort of hear that the goal is to do that, but we also heard from um, Mr. Manfredi that it's, you know, there's going to be a tension between um, the actual cost to the developer in terms of loss of, of revenue, if it's one use versus um, another use. So are those pieces enough to really make this happen? Um, well, they're not necessarily enough to guarantee that this will be a, the fabulous place that we all want it to be, but it is, it is the extent to which zoning can go to that end. Um, so this, so zoning, we can require that a certain kind of space be created or that it have a certain kind of characteristics. Um, 
But what happens after that is, is something that is very hard for zoning to control. Um, so, so that is part of the, the piece that is included here, which is uh, not that common in zoning, is the, uh, is the notion of having the consultant who will do um, a closed look at tenanting and um, sort of curating that retail. Uh, so that's a, uh, we've only done it once before with Alexandria, that's an unusual element. It pushes the envelope. It's also enforced to be. Enforced, yes. Right. It sort of pushes the envelope of what zoning, uh, zoning can but do. But one of the things that zoning could do would be stipulate the size of the unit. So for instance, one of the problems might have been, um, the reason that it took so long to get Moxa and the Veggie Galaxy in there, who knew that we get such great uh, tents in there, was because the spaces are so huge and there wasn't really a willingness to, you know, work with that. And so I would hate to have all this, especially around the one on Broadway, all this retail, first floor, available, but the space is too huge for it to really get used the way we all want it to do. So that seems like something you could put in the um, zone. So there is, uh, in the guidelines speak to a diversity of retail sizes. Um, and there's also a, um, a carrot version in the zoning, which is that uh, ground floor retail can be exempt from counting towards GFA um, if it if it meets certain uh, constrained uh, square footage requirements. Um, and so that will get to the small floor plates because I think that um, you, you heard about the financial offsets that happens in, in the pro forma of the project. So for a developer, if they are committing to build retail, it is um, in their interest to try to avail of all of the possible benefits that they can get or the offsets from G counting towards GFA. Um, so my assumption would be that MIT would attempt to build small retail storefronts so that they can, um, they can utilize that um, GFA exemption. I just want to point out that it didn't really work in Central Square around the, of the um, the Central Square Theater. It didn't work for a long time. We didn't have that particular provision in, uh, in effect in Central Square. Okay. I might also add that in Central Square we had a we had an override constraint based on some historical considerations that really forced the building to be developed the inverse of what we might have wanted to do in terms of creating street front presence. We really had a lot of space in the back and very little space in the front, which was really a challenge when we came to England. We were, we were focused on developing that site in the Central Square Theater, and that became a real challenge with the way that we were trying to uh, deal with historic pieces and try to create that. In the end, the retail was sort of factored in as best we could. This, I think, we're starting with the absolute opposite end. We're starting to understand that retail. And I think, you know, uh, uh, both Council Reeves and I think Representative uh, uh, Decker here mentioned some of these points as well. I think going back, we started with this retail being critically important, the gateway become critically important. And I think our sense of this is that there isn't one big step here. It's a series of incremental, tangible steps that we're going to have to do to make this place interesting and exciting as we go through it. I'm confident there are many ways that we can do this, and we still have a lot of uh, creativity and insight that I think will come from some of the study that we'll do around that area. Uh, on the retail side itself, and I, and I applaud uh, the focus on that because I think from the very beginning that's been pushing us to think more deeply about how this space works. And our discussions that began with some of the retail consultants and some of the retail developers who have been very successful in creating unique spaces have cautioned us about being, you know, uh, just cock blanche and, and wiping out certain areas, sort of like urban renewal, to try to create one big new thing because it often doesn't work. Um, on the retail side, I think, uh, Aaron, I was just talking about a variety of incentives that are in there. I think, you know, we are thinking about ways to you know, make sure that this retail is vibrant um, and diverse. And that, that is clearly an area that we've had ample conversations with a number of you here and the community. Um, our sense of it is that we'll create a variety of smaller spaces here. Uh, we'll have to think about how to give you more comfort around that. I think. Um, we have spent, we're, we're going to end up having more uses to put in the space that we will fit. I, I can already see that. We're, I, we have more ideas that we have spaces to fit in. We're looking for 
frankly, nooks and crannies to fit some of these wonderful ideas in. So uh, I'm overconfident on that. I, I have to give you some sense of comfort around that, and I appreciate that, because I think it's a legitimate concern. And we're going to have to try to balance that without trying to be so prescriptive that we end up having sort of the committee design the horse uh, as we go through this. I think the reorganization of one Broadway down the Broad Canal offers great opportunities, and I'm really excited about the, the opportunities around the gateway because I think uh, Madam Mayor has talked about that site two in particular. We pull some of that back and open that up, and how we treat the T stop. At one point, we thought, let's, let's move it into the building. The other one was, hey, why don't we make that sort of the newsstand area where make it much more transparent and make it so that it's active there and contributing to the retail beside it. The key for us is to open those spaces up. Today, you know, if the press building stays, which, you know, it could go into various scenarios, but if it did stay, at the very least, that, that grade has to come down. The ground floor has to come down, and all the space that you see has to be open. So today, it's one little entrance that, that's probably three feet wide and you go up steps. It's, it's terrible the way it's organized today. So we, we have to think about that type of intervention on that building that stayed, and there may be other plans that envision it without that building there that enable us to create, you know, some indoor outdoor spaces with new and old tying into the Rebecca's building. And I, I've seen enough stuff that I'm confident that we can do it either way. I think it, you know, it is a, sort of an Article 19 design review. It's very granular. And the challenge we have is we have images of visions and ideas and everything from uh, Councilor Reeves talked about, you know, some of the uh, exciting stuff you've seen in, in whether it be Paris, but even like Millennium Park, the, the sort of the Plenska uh, fountain, which is one with the interactive, uh, you know, vision on it, it has faces and the, you know, the fountain comes out. Uh, those are really exciting things. I can envision that type of activity happening, whether that be on the side of the building or in the central gathering spot or above the tea head house or so this, there are many ideas out there. I don't think we'd all agree on any single idea, but there's such an opportunity set that I'm convinced we can incorporate so many interesting ideas. This will be a reconfigured place. Okay, but thank you. I'm, I'm, I know you focus on MIT and the retail that you're thinking about there, but you know I'm, I'm thinking about all of Kendall Square. So there's plenty of retail. Uh, in the Pfizer run up on further down Main Street, if you know the bulky, who knows what's going to happen there. Uh, Boston Properties is doing quite a lot of new retail. They're building a whole other, uh, almost like a little mini mall. Um, that's what's under the wraps right now. Uh, so there's going to be uh, a lot of space for all these ideas um, that when the public goes to your um, uh, charrette um, tomorrow morning, they'll see all of your uh, exciting ideas. Anyway, but, so that's just, just wanted to point that out. Um, I do, I still think that there's probably more that can be put in here to incentivize them to really make this happen more. I know the intention is there, uh, but I, I don't want to like, take too much more time because I do about that particular issue because I do really want to talk bring up some other issues. I want to um, follow on with what Council Decker said already about where is the housing going to be. Uh, when the graduate study gets finished, and I think uh, in Cambridge Court, in, in the areas that you brought up, that makes I'm completely comfortable with that. I'm not sure that you would want to cram the graduate student housing into Kendall kind of Square. I think that makes perfect sense. But that being said, I really think that there should be much more housing built, and part of it is I'm really focusing on the housing to jobs ratio. And I don't want that to get too much out of kilter. Um, and I know it's not a you know a standard metric to use, but as I said before, I really think that it's part of why Cambridge has been able to stay as vibrant as we have and, and as diverse in terms of the people that are living here. Um, so in the zoning, there's a trigger. Once you build um, 600,000 square feet of commercial, you have to stop until you build the housing. So, and I understand why that's in there. I would like that trigger to be even further because I think housing is that important to get in here. When you look at the housing map um, that was up there, uh, you know, the gray dots jump out at you and that's all non-commercial. So we are really uh, priming the pump for the jobs, which is fabulous, but the housing has to stay in line with that. So I would ask for that trigger to be, to be looked at. 
Well, so we haven't really talked about the uh, innovation space that much. And uh, to repeat what I said before, to me, this section, not I mean, what you have around one Broadway, I'm completely comfortable with. I think that's fine there. What I'm concerned about is what's on the south of Main Street, because that, to me, is MIT's campus. And maybe I just spent too much time on MIT's campus, and I sort of that's emblazoned in my brain. That's MIT's campus, and the fact that uh, this section, I don't know what it is, 4.5, I think, that laid out different academic districts uh, for Harvard, for MIT, for Leslie, you know, you, MIT was given, not given, but this was created as an academic district for you, and now you're asking us to, uh, to change that concept. So I want to make that point again. And the second point about the innovation space, and then another point I want to make is, in the town down report, you're currently leasing 500,000 square feet of commercial space for academic uses. So you already need that much space. I don't know how what the term of those leases is, but to me it doesn't make sense that you want to build commercial space when you are using commer leasing commercial space from other developers for your own academic purposes. You want to answer that? Yeah, I'd like to answer that specifically, and then um, we just got the data on, on the responses for the affordability question, which we may share. Um, on that 500,000 lease space, uh, one thing that we pointed out in the presentations at the town gallery meeting is that north of 300,000 is actually the Broad Institute, for which MIT um, basically is on, on the lease um, hold for that. So when, when you think about that, that amount of space, um, so it's really 200,000. It's, it's really 200,000. And I think um, uh, Susan Grobo-Schmidt has talked about how we use that lease space as a, as a buffer, as a continuity for our needs that are up and down based on funding needs. Okay. Well, it, it still stands, except it's a 200,000 okay. square foot number, not a 500,000 square foot number. Thank you for that, that detail. Um, so if I may diverge a bit and just share information. Uh, based on, uh, thanks to Michael Lowell for finding this out, on the September 2012 survey, um, on Boston.com and Craigslist, the median monthly rent for a two-bedroom in Cambridge was $2,800. Um, the rent at MIT, at, um, three rents, because we have different uh, rents for different types of um, residences, at City and Pacific, this is the most expensive one, um, is $2,400. That's about 12% cheaper. These rents include utilities and cable and all the services. And I've done the rent is 20 to 50, 20% cheaper. And at TAN, the rent is 1576, or 44% cheaper. For one bedrooms, um, the median monthly rent in Cambridge is $2,300. And at MIT, is 1200 and 1500 So just that answers the affordability question. Oh, sorry. I was just trying to catch Chris Cotton's eyes to say, can you confirm what you think the average? Yes, uh, so the figures that I believe are cited from our website, that is the most recent uh, survey that we completed on the rental market done last fall. Uh, we actually just took a sample uh, another sample a few weeks ago, so uh, we're working with that data. We should have some information, you know, maybe in the next week or so, as to what the uh, the rents have done uh, over the last six months. We generally do the, the sample twice a year in the fall and in the spring, uh, as units uh, uh, start to become available on the uh, summer fall schedule. Um, so that that is that we've certainly seen rents rising. I think we saw uh, three bedroom rents uh, exceed. $3,000 a month for the first time last fall. We're expecting that number probably gone up uh, uh, since that time. Uh, two bedrooms uh, were just below uh, 3000 roughly 2800 uh, Again, we expect that number probably gone up a, a little bit as well, uh, given what we've seen happening with the rent market. Uh, and um, uh, one bedroom is likely, likely as well. Those figures, I believe, are from our, our website. Where, where is the information gathered from, Chris? If you could explain. Sure. Uh, 
what we do is we look at um, listings that are posted on Boston.com. We also look at a sample, a daily sample of uh, Craigslist, uh, trying to look at it like uh, anyone who doesn't have an into a, a law market unit. Uh, if arriving in the city, how would you look at renting an apartment? So you know, the most popular way is you, you, you'd find it. Uh, uh, and available when you're looking on not the, the internet, so we're looking at Craigslist, we're looking at Boston.com, we're going through, I think, roughly a thousand listings uh, on Craigslist that have got some uh, Cambridge listed somewhere, pulling out the ones that are clearly not Cambridge, but as you skip out of that. Uh, and then uh, uh, putting that, those uh, asking prices together and coming out with a, a median number uh, as to what the uh, asking, rent, asking price is by unit size. Uh, this is consistent with uh, how we've been doing it for the last 15 or so years, though, about five or eight years ago, maybe. Uh, we started looking at more on the online and getting more uh, uh, listings from Craigslist. And it, it, I just, I want to just pick up on this for a minute. That, that I think it's important to note that doesn't mean that's what the average rate is in the city, but rather that is what the average vacancy is being advertised for. Which is a, a that, that's difference. right. That's right. You know, it, it, it's, it's really hard to, to to get at what the average rent is because uh, it's not data that's publicly accessible. Uh, our approach is to look at it like uh, anyone looking for a housing unit would. Uh, what's available? What are they faced with uh, when they're doing a housing search? Because those are the folks that we see coming in, uh, talking to us, uh, having trouble looking for units, and that that's what's available. Certainly, there are a lot of. Tenants who have uh, in smaller buildings that have got very good have been there for a long time, uh, and you know it's hard to get at that, that number. It would be also, and I'm not 100 percent sure how you can gather this information, but but um, as a small property owner myself, you know I know that that you know I I have been very lucky to have long-term tenants in in my own house. Uh, I had a change not all that long ago and did what you just said, went on to Craigslist and went on to Boston.com and looked at. And, and I will tell you that from my own experience, the rent that people were getting, the actual rent that people were getting was far different than what was advertised on those websites. And, and I think that's an important, you know, I, I'm thinking, I, I heard the gasps around this table. When, when the 2800 was was stated. And I think the reality is is that the rents are significantly lower than that. And, and I'm not sure how we can actually gather that information, but you know, I, I saw, it's, it's funny, I just saw a house that was advertised on uh, Craigslist and it was a neighbor's, and I've been in the house many, many times, so I, I looked at the pictures and I said, I've been in this house, so I kind of looked at it and it was advertised, I think it was a two and a half bedroom, it was advertised at $3,200, and I know that they got $2,300 from they actually rented it. So it was significantly less. And I think, I just put that out there as a cautionary note that, that those numbers are, especially with these websites and the, you know, we have hundreds of would-be realtors who think that their property is worth you know, <laughs> anyway. Thank you. I, I also think, um, but I do, I, for me, the point is I want to know when people are looking for rents, what are they looking at, whether it's a graduate student or a private person, those are the rents that they're looking at to get into the market, whether someone gets them. I, I'm going to guess they get pretty close to that based on my own antibiotic knowledge. Um, but what I also, I think what we've asked, two things that I've asked and haven't been answered were, one, where would you build graduate housing? Um, and if you need to build it. And two, the other question that I asked that I don't think was answered was um, this issue of additional programming that you foresee the need for in the future. Um, I've asked you about that as well. And, and that plays an important role in this discussion. You want to take the, uh, yeah, I'll show the housing one and then I'll. Well, on the housing, I, um, what I said is that I think depending on the kinds of needs that the Institute and Professor Clay identifies, um, where it is built or where the adjustments may need to happen um, is going to depend on the types of outcomes of that study. But I have gone through that our preference today, based on some of the uh, planning uh, guidance we have, would be on the west end of the campus. Um, I've identified the Westgate Lotus as a particular area of interest. 
Um, there are certain properties along Vassar Street, uh, including California paints, that could be considered for, for housing. Um, there are certain other properties side by side with um, City Pacific and, and W35 New Washington. Uh, so those would be ones that I think we would look at uh, as future development for residential student housing. Um, so I think that that's basically the answer. We cannot speci specifically say this is the one because I think but you would say that you own the property. We, we own those properties. We have the capacity to develop um, housing. What um, I just want to this is a follow up to that question. And I still want to. Um, I, I think the other thing that I'm going to be looking for in this um, zoning language is um, because I'm, I'm sure it's hard. Well, you must have somebody there has an idea of what future space you need for programming and academic. What I'm going to be looking for is not just an answer, um, but also something in the zoning that would actually trigger if you require um, so much space for X number of square footage to develop for academic purposes, and um, you do not build it on land that you already own as of the date of this vote, if a vote takes place on this, um, then there has to be something that I think also triggers you having to go back to whether it may be possibly this property. I, I just want to make sure where the, I have been really upfront with, with people about um, both with MIT and with residents about that. You know, again, on the face of this, I'm, I'm kind of excited about what could be there. At the same time, I'm also really listening very clearly to, you know, in the future, if there really is this need for such great additional housing and additional programming, I think somebody quoted to me that they see that the, uh, the MIT needs, was it 500,000 square feet um, a year of growing space needs? And my response is, well, let's stop, you know, cut the number of graduate students you accept and, and stop expanding your labs. And, and I don't think that would work too well either, but I think you can't have it both ways. So I, I'm just, for, for all the lawyering people here um, who are looking, working with you on the zoning and to community development, um, I, I want us to explore is there the possibility of bringing language that actually would trigger before the city would permit uh, and before they would also agree to buy additional land that um, we would look at the need of sort of if there's future need for additional academic purposes that they might have to actually go back to something that, that they already own. And, and again, I know I'm just fleshing this out right now for the first time, but it's something that I, I want to have a, um, a more informed conversation that will probably be uh, better understood when someone else is talking about it besides me. All right. If, if I can just say that, go ahead. So uh, thanks for the question. I think um, we have historic numbers for the growth of campus space that we could share, uh, and we have a sense of the capacity of the sort of open parcels on campus, and, and have the confidence that those lines give us decades of, of capacity uh, for if we continue to historic expansion of the campus. We undertook an exercise in 2008 to 2010 to assess our most pressing academic needs, and that led to the identification of five projects, a nano facility, a facility for our environmental research, a facility for music and theater arts, a renovation of the space for math, and a renovation of the space for Sloan and economics. Of those properties, or of those projects, three, possibly four, are going to be renovations of existing buildings. And what that speaks to is the fact that we face an enormous deferred maintenance problem on campus. And, and our attention needs to be focused on, on reinvesting in our existing buildings. And, and that's sort of where the skew is. Uh, as far as the East Campus, it's the linkage between our management school and our science and engineering and humanities uh, complex. And, and as while we have no immediate needs to put new academic buildings in that area, uh, if we were in the future to put things there by any, beyond residential, my vision would be that it would likely be things that link those schools. So we have programs like our Engineering Systems Division, which is a, a strong linkage between the Sloan School of Management and the School of Engineering. That's the kind of thing that I think you might imagine happening there. I think it's important to note that I mean, the key premise behind this was that we were going to preserve the existing academic capacity in this East Campus. That's how we started. So it was, in order to do this, we required the zoning change that is before you to enable us to do the commercial, the retail, the housing, all of that part beyond the capacity that exists for academic future capacity, which we're reserving principally in three sites that we've identified in here into this into this space here that gives us, we believe, decades of future use 
issues in the East Campus. As Marty has pointed out, we've gone through a, a fairly detailed study, uh, and there wasn't a lot of uses that were targeted to this area in the in, in the short term period here. So us preserving that academic capacity was a key number one consideration for MIT to consider moving forward with the revitalization of Kendall. Okay. I'm just going to give folks a little update here that, that Mickey is going to very quickly finish her comments, then Leland, Craig, Denise, Marjorie, I am going to say that you just finished, is that correct? No. Uh, Henrietta and Ken. So we have a full queue here of questions. Um, go ahead, Mickey. Okay, so I was, I'm in the middle of talking about um, the, the commercial um, build out, uh, the 980,000 square feet, which I really don't think is appropriate. But it sounds like most people um, don't seem to have a problem with that. So one of the uh, things that I mentioned before that's so critical to why Kendall has been successful is this the innovation spaces. And these are not what you would think. They're just little places sort of scattered around that are disappearing now with the um, you know, large buildings and consolidation. So the 980,000 square feet of commercial is most likely to go to big uh, players that want to come in to get the Kendall kind of Square magic that comes mainly from MIT. Uh, and I really don't think that the 5% innovation space is anywhere near adequate to um, keep Kendall Square the innovation and the innovative place that it is. So I mentioned this in a little one-on-one um, -on -one meeting, actually it was like a one-on-eight meeting that I had. And, uh, you know, I think that a minimum one-third of the commercial space that you want to build should be devoted towards this shared small space that's what we're calling the innovative space. And I think that will go a long way towards maintaining this exciting entrepreneurial spirit that is in, um, in Kendall Square. So that's one point I want to make. We haven't talked about sustainability. I don't know, um, I don't want to just keep on talking, but um, you know, it seems like, it seems like there are more things in here. Um, for instance, there's a, a co-generation is something that isn't allowed use in this district, and that's something that MIT has done really well. And you know, I would be willing to even grant exemptions for that GFA in order to have the cogen be located right there in the um, in that PUD, so there there are lots of details that still need to be worked out, and I don't know. It still seems like it's a fifty thousand square a fifty thousand foot um, discussion, as opposed to you know what about section thirteen point this point that, um, and that still hasn't really happened. There's a lot. There are a lot of exemptions in here that MIT has um, requested in this um, petition. And it's hard for me to kind of list them into a table. Uh, there's the retail exemption, which I think we all agree is a good thing, but there are other exemptions for, for height. Um, and I still think somehow we need to have a discussion about exactly getting a handle on, on those things. The, the community benefits was touched on. That section needs an awful lot of work I don't know how we can proceed with this whole petition since it is an integral, I don't know if it's an integral, but it is a part of the petition. So that part needs a lot of work that's probably not going to happen in this context. Um, and then of course there's all of the, the um, building that's going on in all of Kendall Square. And MIT is a huge piece of it, but um, you know those gray circles are really clustered in this part of, of Cambridge, the, the, the gray, uh, I'm referring to the, to the non-residential buildings that are, that are coming online. <clears throat> I, I think I have a comment on, on a few of them. Certainly on the innovation space, I would say, you know, I think we're very proud of the work we've done in innovation space in Cambridge. Um, we started doing some innovative stuff uh, regarding small suites in 1999, well before a lot of discussions that we been focused on innovation. And we spent a lot of time um, you know, building that type of space. And it's not, you know, today, even at One Broadway, we have probably 700 entrepreneurs working. 
And it's, it's, it's such a delicate ecosystem that it's important that the venture capital firms that supply the capital that allow these en en entrepreneurs to start up are cl located close by. We spent a great deal of time trying to attract a number of these back into, into the Cambridge environment. They've gone out to Waltham for a number of them. And we've had the success of bringing um, you know, a number of them back back home, particularly one Broadway Highland Capital and, and Charles River Ventures who moved back. The other notion of this is, even if we have 700 entrepreneurs today there in the office space, we think that's actually a pretty good mechanism. As we speak, we are breaking ground on new space in Lab Central, which is a new experiment that we've been working in years to try to figure out how to do the same thing in laboratory environment, which is a much more complicated uh, uh, vehicle because there's a lot more sort of regulatory uh, challenges in that. Um, that is um, about 30,000 square feet of space that we're implementing at 700 Main Street today. And that's a very exciting prospect. Uh, but beyond that, it's, it's a continuum here. And I think we've got to be really careful about how we manage this because when one of these 700 people or one, one of these small lab setups that may have three or four people working on it become successful, they move to the 2,500 square foot suite or the 5,000 square foot suite or the 10,000 square foot suite. And you have to contrast that entire continuum with a Novartis that's a million square feet. And so I think even the Novartises and the Pfizer's and the Sanofi's have all established venture capital arms that provide capital to the startups. They are licensed in the technology so this ecosystem that we have of large, small, and medium is really delicate and, and frankly still being understood by all of us. So we want to make sure that we don't, in this point in time, freeze that into a zoning mechanism that's so prescriptive that we actually end up being anti-innovation. So we totally get it. We spend so much time on this. Today we're building some spaces even down at 640 Memorial Drive that are intermediate sized suites, something like 5,000 square feet for a lab company. That would be a, a fairly, that would probably be a second stage after an entrepreneurship. That entrepreneur uh, uh, company comes out of Lab Central would probably look to that next stage of growth. The other thing that does happen in sort of the, the 10 and 20,000 square foot range for some of these uh, enterprises is these emerging companies are forecasting growth. They may lease 20,000 square feet. They're only using 10 when they start. You know, they want their space in one, one location. So they'll turn around and sublet to the smaller users, the remaining 10,000 square feet on short-term leases. So that helps facilitate a financing mechanism for these startup companies that can come in and use the space, and as they meet the success, they can then grow out to other places. So it really is a, a collection of mechanisms that are happening. So it's not just the small spaces, but I think we are very tuned into all of those. And uh, counselors, you, you've been you've been pushing us on this, and I think we we recognize it. We, you know, we are looking at ways to improve what we're doing here. Uh, but I would caution that there is a very organic ecosystem that is working on this innovation front. So we, we will be looking um, to respond and make, to improve some of that at your request. I know this is a long uh, list of people on deck, so I'll try to be uh, a little faster than the previous speaker. <laughs> I think uh, I mean, Councilman is going to raise, a, raise some great points. Um, I, I shared the concern of the ratio of job to housing that was first, to recognize that was first brought into the council by uh, Brian Spataco and the Graduate Student Council of MIT, uh, the first to present uh, to the council on uh, on that ratio. And I think the CDD has done a lot of, in the discussions I've had, a lot of thinking about about that ratio across the rest of the Kingdom Square district. Um, with regards to the innovation space, I also want to I think Steve is learning that no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, I think we should, it's, it's important to recognize uh, that, and say, I think a lot of the innovation space that we're asking for here you know, was uh, piloted and created and made possible by uh, your team uh, at Utenko. Uh, and I think that, uh, I just want to say, I do, keep, I, I do recognize that and keeping that in mind. I think you know, my pushing on uh, the number is not so much uh, it's not at all, I think, a concern that you're not going to continue that same commitment to entrepreneurs and innovation space that you've uh, I think been the leader on in Kendall Square, but uh, more important is that we're setting a precedent here with uh, this MIT petition uh, that will then uh, carry through as we look at the rest of the PUDs and the zoning that we're going to consider as part of a larger uh, occasion planning process. 
Uh, and I think, lastly, I would diverge uh, from Councilor Bisman's point on the campus uh, planning, whether or not we should be putting commercial on uh, south of Main Street. You know, I've, as a reason alum, I have very, very strong opinions. Uh, but I think it's not necessarily the council's purview to be saying what should be done. I think that uh, I encourage uh, you know, people that have that opinion to lobby uh, MIT, the uh, MIT administration, to go directly. Uh, I think that is an important dialogue to be had. Uh, I worry about uh, the council starting to get involved in saying, we'll put this here and that there, and you know, MIT, uh, I would like MIT to come to that consensus and decision on its, on its own. Um, I think I'm more worried about the you know, bill form and how you interact, how the decisions that are made interact with the rest of the city, more so than trying to manage what you're doing on, on, uh, on your campus. To Councillor uh, Becker's point, I agree on the, uh, on the need for affordable housing. Uh, I think that she raises a great point on the price uh, being uh, an important uh, deciding lever. My own anecdotal evidence has been that uh, platform classics, I know some are in much more expensive houses uh, and apartments, and some are in much cheaper houses. But uh, the price that's listed uh, on the website when you, you first get admitted to MIT and you go and you see, well, what's the options for on campus housing? Uh, and then you go to practice and you see what are the prices. Uh, and even though we're looking at the median, median income, median price listed on Craigslist, there are uh, lower prices that people can then go after. Uh, I think that does affect the rate, the percentage of, of students that are looking for housing, to look to get into the MIT housing. Uh, so I, I, I think that when you say that 80% of those that are requested are, get, are afforded housing, uh, that number is driven by the pricing that is, is put on the website. Um, and I agree with Councilor Reeves uh, on the uh, idea of placemaking. Uh, this is the reason I started the English question about the 100 feet of, of space between uh, the head house and the maximization building and how much space you need to make a vibrant location. Uh, but I will say that uh, with Jesse uh, on the retail team, uh, the thoughts around placemaking uh, are so much better than they were two years ago. Uh, it's, it's been a, it's a radical improvement. Um, I think it's at least heading in the right direction. Uh, getting back to, and I think that, yeah, you know, I've talked previously last time around about the grocery store, uh, and I think that uh, I'm pleased with that message. I think you've gotten the message around the grocery store, and I think that uh, we'll need to um, continue to, to harp on that. Uh, another point I will make um, is that I really like, you know, the throwaway, but I think, you know, the linkage, I'm, I'm really a fan of the linkage between uh, MIT Sloan and uh, the economics department back to the rest of campus. You know, there's a steam tunnel system that can get pretty much get from 77 almost all the way to uh, the MIT Media Lab. You could extend that over to Sloan. That would be great on those cold winter days. Um, and then, uh, I think that's those comments. And then I would also make a comment to CDD uh, in the, to be, uh, to be asked for when we, when we come back with the for zoning guidelines. We'd like some language around banks. Um, and we did this for uh, North Mass Ave, but limiting the overall frontage of banks. I think, uh, it's something I'd like to see in the design guidelines uh, that MIT has already uh, agreed to, to conform with in their, in their plan. Um, and then a question for the manager, I don't think he's left, but um, it's not so much a question, but ask for information back. On the commercial proposal for uh, this position, <coughs> I uh, kind of gave the numbers for um, for the taxes that will be coming back to the city. What I'd like to know is uh, the pilot agreement with MIT says that if commercial land is converted to academic use, the tax, the high tax and payment loop taxes falls off uh, over the course of three years. Uh, with that, you know, given that this is a pretty significant amount of uh, upzoning and uh, taxes that are going to be being received from this property. Uh, you know, does that three year does that still give us enough buffer uh, to maintain fiscal stability within the city, or should that three years be five years uh, for this increased portion? Uh, so those are some of the comments I wanted to throw out there. I didn't really want to look for response to, to try and keep this short. But the next question I wanted, the question I wanted to ask, uh, I was very grateful to have a uh, few from the planning board here. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, housing and how do we talk with CDD about how do we get more housing into Kendall Square. Uh, there aren't a whole, uh, 
you know, there's only been one housing site that's been identified that MIT wants to pursue for housing in this uh, in this petition. Um, and I guess my in the housing site, they, so how do we get more housing? We want more affordable housing. I'm really excited about this middle income housing that we're planning. But that middle income housing is only above 250 feet. Uh, and so we're in, currently the, uh, the thought was that 300 feet should be the limit. So we're only getting really 50 feet of this middle income housing. And understanding that you know, height is really a, uh, you know, it's a council, it's a council uh, policy decision that we set what the overall envelope should be and what you know, FAR and what height should be. Uh, so I acknowledge that you, know, that ultimately you can say that this is ultimately a uh, something that the council needs to decide once it's healthy gives guidance back to the planning board. But we'd love to hear your thinking around, well, you know, if we're trying to get more affordable housing, we have one affordable housing site, how high could we go? Um, could we get to, you know, the uh, John Hancock building is 800 feet. I think we've probably get like a mixed reaction on whether or not we should have a building that bibles that. Is place. today's headline. <laughs> so this is building. Uh, but how, do, how does the council uh, think about uh, how, how, how we can make that number? And, and also, I think, uh, noting that uh, within the zoning guidelines, it's said that um, any height is reviewed by the planning board. Uh, you know that includes like doing the shadow study and the study on how to impacts neighboring buildings. Uh, but I would like to get as much affordable housing and as much middle income housing as we possibly can. Uh, and it seems to me that increasing the height uh, and this, this is only allows for that. You know, it's only this one building on the, on the drawing board. Uh, this seems like our best opportunity to do that. So I guess that's. Kicking it over to you for your thoughts uh, and, uh, and perspectives. Thanks. Uh, tall buildings are very expensive to build. Um, and the higher you go, the more expensive they are to build. The higher you are up, the bigger the rent that you can get. So, if you, I think the part of the logic behind the 